From the Virginia Audio Collective at WTJU 91.1 FM and Brown College at the University of Virginia, this is Symposia. Today's episode on Symposia is a conversation with a musician from Charlottesville's sister city in France, Besançon. And his name is? Oh, Damien Grolo, or Damien in English. We were lucky enough to be able to sit down with him, as well as John Durth, who heads up the jazz ensemble here at UVA, a few weeks back while Damien was here performing with the ensemble. And that was really special for me and Ben because we are actually about to go visit Baisansan. So the way that this got set up is a little convoluted, so bear with me. John Durth, who who runs uh, the Jazz Ensemble at UVA, was dispatched as a cultural ambassador to our sister city, Baisansan, by the Charlottesville Sister Cities Commission. Um, This year, the recipients of that exchange grant is going to be us. So we are essentially making that trajectory that that John Durth made a number of years ago. And when he was there, he met this jazz pianist and composer, actually multi-instrumentalist, Damien, um, and brought uh, brought him to Charlottesville in, in return. So we're sort of uh, uh, the next link in the chain, the next node of this long-running Charlottesville business exchange. And I'm just super excited to go on this wacky field trip with you. <laughs> Absolutely. It is it is going to be um, really fun, I think. And if you are a listener, I'm sure you will hear so much more about it because we're going over there to produce some podcast documentaries. I've been spending time in France since, basically since I was an undergrad, um, but most of that time has been spent in Paris. And I can tell you, I think in 10 or 15 years of going to Paris, I don't think I've met someone who's from Besançon. So on the one hand, that maybe they're just not, you know, talking about it all the time. Um, But I think it also tells you something about, you know, from the Parisian point of view, any city in the provinces that they can sort of look down on, the way that someone from New York or LA might in America. So I've been really curious to, to know, like, okay, but this is, this is a pretty big city with a really rich history. What, what is happening there? Who are the people that live there? And you know, why is, why is business on our sister city in Charlottesville? So I want to start by asking, when did you first start studying music? Uh, at the age of eight. Okay, so so quite some time, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't to be offensive, but you were young. You were young. You were young, correct. I'm 40. I don't know if I'm old or young. <laughs> You're right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about you, John? When What was your first musical experience like? Well, it's it's an interesting coincidence because I got my trumpet when I was eight. And that's when I really started to think I would be a musician. But before that, I had a father who was obsessed with listening to music and taught me so much about music from the earliest age. And we'd sit and play drums, drum brushes on a tray to records, to like Charlie Parker records, Duke Ellington. And that's how I started in music. I was doing that when I was a small child, two or three. And Damian, did you start with the piano or did you start with a different instrument? No, with the piano. Um, when I was younger, my sisters, my two sisters, uh, took uh, lessons uh, on the organ. organ. Mm-hmm. And I played with it without knowing anything. But I remember at the age of seven, I was in a colony, colony de vacances. Summer camp. Summer camp. <laughs> and I spent s- several afternoons uh, playing uh, L'hymne à la joie. The, no, Ode to Joy. Him, yeah. Ode to Joy <laughs> on the piano when I was six or seven. I remember this. And I was 
Astonished? <laughs> That's a very clear memory of how old, childhood. How old were you then? Seven? Six or seven, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when I got my trumpet, I remember I remember it clearly the day I got a trumpet, yeah, yeah. which was a $15 instrument, and I got it because I'd seen a movie about trumpet players. I wanted to be an actor when I was a little kid, and I would always act out these movies, couldn't make a trumpet, so I got one. And I remember taking it outside, we lived in the country, and just starting to play the scale. I found the scale immediately. That's maybe the moment where you fall in love. <laughs> yeah, in a way. And the sound yeah. of that trumpet going over the the countryside. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like playing outside. How did you eventually focus on jazz? I started with jazz. I think you started with classical and jazz. No. No, just classical. <laughs> <laughs> None of the two. Uh, I studied with um, songs from Elton John, from... Okay. Yes. Pop music. Yes, mm -hmm. but it was written um, very simply, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was improvising during three or four years, I think, on songs like like it when I was young, yeah. and then I I began the jazz at uh, at twelve, and then classical music at sixteen. Okay. Oh, okay. Much different than I thought. I got to classical music later. But I didn't get to rock and pop music until much later, until I was in almost 20, mm. before I could start to really appreciate mm -hmm. uh, that music. I was such a snob uh, I <laughs> about jazz. <laughs> I listened to Jimi Hendrix at 27, I think. <laughs> yeah, Jimi Hendrix, oh my goodness. And Sting, uh, Sting at uh, 30. <laughs> Sting, did you Never say? Never before. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So. Yeah, me too. It's sort of like me too, you know. But it, it, my friends were all, of course, into the, like the Beatles and everything like that. I, that was my entree to pop music when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. about seventeen. I started really appreciating the Beatles, mm. and then I had to I had to give it up. My snobbery. <laughs> <laughs> now the two of you met in Besançon on a Charlottesville sister cities. Uh, Jaunt trip, correct? trip delegation. Yeah, mm -hmm. I went. I, I I can tell this story briefly if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah. That's why he's here. <laughs> and basically, to go backwards, we canceled his appearance here three times, mm -hmm. because when we met in Besançon, I had gone over there to be part of this delegation to try to really talk about jazz music. I was hanging out, but I wanted to, you know, participate in some music and the and. Damien was there playing in uh, a local music festival. I think there was an arts festival. And he invited me on a bunch of his gigs. And we hit it off musically, but he was so generous to me to, to invite somebody he didn't know to come on and play on a gig. You know, a lot of trust there. So, and, and I was impressed with his range of music that we did because we did very interesting, you know, we did jazz at a, you know, with, you could hear a pin drop and everybody's listening to every note. And we played Latin music in a bar, and that's what I did in New York for many years, played Latin music. So I was so impressed with the range, and I said, you got to come to UVA. And we decided to do it, and we canceled it. They had to cancel it again and again. Is this your first time actually visiting since no. since you met? No, or? second time. Um, I met Pauline. She's a, she's a singer from Charlottesville. She came in 2016, uh, first in January, after we played in Besançon in April, then we played in uh, La Hague, The Hague, the Hague. <laughs> the Hague. <laughs> Amsterdam, uh, and then they in ils m'ont invité. Yeah, they invited. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Me uh, in no November 16. It's to play in uh, Washington, <laughs> and Lee, and to play in the Dutch embassy. Is that when you made the record? Uh, the live record, yes. Uh, it's the, there is a, a guy, Terry Vopstein, the director. Okay. Of Washington and Lee. Oh, Lexington. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's a live uh, record. Yes, Royce Campbell, Chris Daman, a uh, bass, Chris, player, yeah, Dab, David Drummond on drum, David Pauline Drummond. and me. Oh. <laughs> and where, where is Pauline from? Is she Belgian? No, originally? Dutch. She's Dutch. They're both Dutch, Gerard, yeah. Pauline and Gerard. Okay. Nicest people. The they, they're her, his hosts here. Yeah. 
and people. just the sweetest people. Yeah. Um, I, I was curious, John, how would you describe Damien's music? Is there <laughs> something particularly Besançon about his jazz, about his sound, or is it just cosmopolitan? Yes, whenever like... he plays, I just see visions of Victor Hugo rising up. <laughs> <and> going, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Beethoven Ode to Joy influence coming back uh, <laughs> you know, century. It's, it's hard. I mean, I want to talk about his music. You know, I'd love to talk about it intelligently, it's it's hard to talk about music, really, in mm. a way. But I would say, you know, we did an interview uh, with someone from Seville Weekly, and uh, Shay asked Damien what he was doing with his music. And after Damien talked a little while about his difficulties with English, <laughs> he came up with, my compositions tell a story, which, okay, I definitely felt that with his work, that there was always a story. He's a consummate pianist, you know, it's like the piano chops are ridiculous, and it's very touch-oriented, so it's very sensitive. So his trio is very interactive, like in the Bill Evans tradition, although it doesn't copy that. It's Damien's music, which is very distinctive, really tuneful music mm -hmm. that is in its way very accessible, deceptively simple, I call it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so there's that aspect to his music. But then also he's super into Latin and world music and plays flute and plays all that music on the piano. So he's really got a Janus face of two, of a real yin and a yang to his playing. <laughs> Fair enough? That's I, it. I, I like that, that <laughs> point of deceptively simple. I mean, I, I was able to hear you guys play at uh, the concert with the UVA Jazz Ensemble in, in Old Cabal. I, you know, riffing on what, what you were saying about this kind of deceptive simplicity, I felt like, I mean, you had this kind of relentless creativity. Every phrase yeah. you set up, you think it's going a certain way, and you always just add something, yeah, something that else. surprises you at, yeah. at every moment. I, I, it was really fun to listen to. Actually, it was really I exciting. Think, I will also say that Great. one of the big reasons to invite him here was for him to be with our students. Mm -hmm. And you saw those four horn players, who I mean, the three horn players who joined us. And they're really amazing people. But he, Damien has been so generous with the students and hanging out with them, and they're just getting so much out of this. And really, Not through teaching so much as just being with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How has that process been for you uh, to come and, and teach students and, and, and work with the ensemble here at UVA? Teaching, it's for me like sharing, more sharing than teaching. Depends on who you have uh, with you, but I think, yes, sharing. Yeah, that's how you do do I gave, uh, Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I gave a lot of links to for music to, to Ben yesterday, the yeah. guy who played piano. And to the flute player, you were really helping Cole. Yeah. For, um, a what were you named... guys doing with the bending? F um, it's, do you know Steve Kurala? No. A uh, guy, a uh, flutist uh, who played with uh, Chick Corea. Okay, example. cool. He played first music here and uh, he, he practiced a thing he, he called the fretless flute. Okay. Ooh. Okay, fretless. <laughs> like uh, if you were playing uh, Bonsuri, mm. Indian uh, float. Okay. And uh, yes, he, I, I say to me, maybe he's young. He, he never has, uh, he, he, he n'a jamais entendu. Uh, il n'a jamais entendu quoi? He never listened. Ah, never. Uh, like he never kind of heard it done a certain way. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Cold, you <laughs> this mean. This way of yeah. playing the flute. Mm. And it's done with a half? Yeah, you have you have uh, many uh, holes yeah. in your flute. Yeah. Do like this. And with the harmonics, you yeah. can do, uh, for example, you, if you go mm. to the G to A, mm -hmm. and then you can, with the same... Uh, fingering, you can go to the D to the E. Okay. <clears throat> so it's really fun to, to practice. <laughs> and maybe this guy in 10, 15, 20 years, I don't know, <laughs> maybe <laughs> he will try it. <laughs> it sounds like both of you have had a lot of like multicultural experiences from music. Could you talk a little bit about what that's like, you know, working with musicians who speak different languages and, and maybe sometimes there's a language barrier, or a cultural barrier. I'd love to hear about what the creative process is like when, when you're doing that. 
I think Damien has done a lot more of it in a way. I've done it with Latin music a lot. It's just a big invitation to openness. You just get to learn something new. But you've got so many stories, like those musicians you worked with in Africa. Yes. In Africa, they speak a very good French <laughs> because uh, of our history. You know that? Mm-hmm. For the best and the worst. The best and the worst. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All glory. Um, but I play a lot of music from Brazil. It's called uh, Le Choro. It's an old style of music from the 19th century. And I don't really understand Portuguese. I mean, after two weeks in Rio, I was able to to listen Portuguese like it, if it was uh, French with a big accent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I can't speak. But I play a lot with guy from Brazil. Uh, in Brooklyn, in, on Sunday, I will play uh, with guys who play this, this style of music. And uh, yes, we, y- you speak the same musical lang- language. Mm-hmm. You can mm-hmm. share the love you have yeah. of, of what's this in. music with the love they have with the same <laughs> style. Yeah, I played a lot of salsa and other related Latin music in New York, which was a great discovery for me. But what's interesting in that music, in Latin music in New York, is the demographics of the different instrument groups. (laughs) Because the piano players and the bass players usually had private lessons and came from families that, you know, gave them the (laughs) private lessons. And then the drummers and the singers were basically self-taught and street, very different people very tough too you know like oh my god just some of the tales at the beginning when i didn't understand some of this i won't share that right now but and then they had what they always <laughs> referred to as the american horn players and that was me and anybody who was hired to be in these salsa bands latino or not we're the american horn players we're jazz players and then you learn the style from people who are brought up in it i'll, I'll tell one funny story about i played in a band sabor with Angel Canales as the lead singer. And he loved me. He was a great guy. Just one of these very talented, self-taught people singing and playing. And so anybody can pick up the clave in in a salsa band and go, mm, jack, jack, boom, go, 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 go. So Gringo over here is like, fine, that's cool. And I had to learn to dance, you know, move your feet. And that was the whole thing you had to learn. But I noticed that Angel, you know, would pick up the, the cowbell and he would just play quarter notes on the cowbell. He'd just be going like, bing, gong, bing, gong. So I'm like, yeah, I can do that. So I picked up the cowbell one night and started playing these quarter notes, okay? Who knows what he was hearing when I was doing this? And this nice man turned around to me with the worst expression, the glare <laughs> on, in his eye. And he grabbed the cowbell out of my hand and he said, don't be playing that thing if you're going to play it like that. <laughs> and it's a, the message is basically there's more to this. It's a mystery, you know, so have a little respect for the mystery. But I just didn't know. You don't, do, you don't pick up the cowbell. No. No. That's way, yeah. <laughs> way bad. Yeah, if you, you can crash a war band. Uh, yes, the, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's totally true. Have you seen that happen? Uh, yes, one time with a... Uh, it was like hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, a team gold. A cobalt of the... Um, like the... Shaker. Sh- shaker, yeah. yeah. Shaker one. Shaker, uh, shaker it's... Uh, Maracas. Yeah, or of the uh, guy who played very badly the... The Guido. Timbales. Timbales. I, I was curious about how the jazz scene in Besançon connects with what's happening in Paris or in other parts of France or in Europe, I mean? Not so much. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because you n- don't have so much musicians. You, know, you have a, a friend of mine, his name is Vladimir Torres. He plays bass, yeah. he composed. And he's like a um, monster of um, selling his own music. Uh-huh. So he played everywhere in France, in Europe. He's very d- do-it-yourself, right? He's like... 
promoting yeah. himself. That's yeah. the thing in music. You got to realize it's we look like we're, you know, connected, and we are artistically very connected. But we are not. The music business almost does not exist anymore. It's almost like there is no music business. It's just what, where you are. You know, I lived in New York for years, and uh, to go to try to work in New York, the it's very hard to do. Let's just say it's very hard to get. To get stuff like is it like more of a scene than like a, 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 a an established system? Well, it's that, and it's also the fact that the established system that used to exist, as much as we didn't like it, has been totally dismantled mm -hmm. by the internet. So mm -hmm. unless you're willing to spend your time promoting yourself, talking to everybody about how great you are, and uh, making sure that you're ahead of everybody else who's doing that, yeah. which has nothing to do with what I want to be doing with my life. So it's a different, but we make the music for other reasons, I think. You know? what, what, are, what are your reasons? Well, that's a good damn question. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you brought it up. I, <laughs> I know, no, that's an excellent question. I mean, you, I, I do it because I can't help it. I absolutely cannot help it. If I didn't do it, it would be like not having breakfast or something. If, a couple of days in a row, you wouldn't feel good. It's, yeah, it's a way of life, I think. It's just a way of life. Yeah. Was there a time of your life when you considered not doing music mm. either as a career or or at all? No. No. Not for me. Mm, never. I was always trying to consider what I should do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point I was thinking, oh, I should move to Las Vegas and get a job in the in a casino, in a show band, and just you know, make a ton of dough doing that. Because I had a family to support, so I was just thinking how I would do that. I fell into teaching quite by accident. I have no degree, but thank God the teaching gig I have is fantastic. And I get to deal with people on a very uh, intimate musical level that I really enjoy. Yeah. And what about you? Uh, me, I love to play on stage. So all my energy <laughs> is for for this so i have some opportunities to work with different musicians li like you like uh, uh like everyone else so i could be a composer for um, movies for example i could be a teacher but i like to play on stage i like to share music with musicians, with people, mm -hmm. that's what I really like. So, no, but there is some music I don't really like to play. So, I no. don't like the uh, music uh, trop triste. Okay, sad, 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 sad girl music. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what is he saying? He said he says he doesn't like music that's too sad. Too sad. Yeah. Wow. I. I, love I sad think music. I, I yeah, used to play, I, I mean, um, for example, music for uh, uh, Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, tango music. Mm -hmm. Some of pieces are too sad for me. Wow. I used to play a lot of tango music with singers. Uh, I used to play to some French music or uh, some French songs or a really, really um, dark deep in mm -hmm. pathetic. No? Pathetic. Yeah. yeah pathetic but it, and but in pathetic. French also, the pathetic in French, it also is like, um, pathetic. you know, we, we say pathetic in, in a slightly different way. Yes. Yeah. Different, anyway. Yeah. Not like uh, Rimbaud or Baudelaire, for example, uh, who, who invented the, the spleen. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. it's not it in the very pathetic way. Mm. I don't like it. I don't mm. like play this type of feel, uh, feeling on stage. Mm. Yeah. So I quit. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that's why I I love music from Brazil. Uh, happy sadness, <laughs> mm. <laughs> like a translation. It's a more complex feeling. Yes. Maybe. Like, uh, and um, I don't know music from Cuba. Maybe, uh, or, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Or um, music from Africa, from Asia, America. <laughs> Does it make you feel sad when you play it? Is that why you don't like it? 
Because you have to feel that when you're playing it. I don't like to share a pathetic feeling mm -hmm. to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Things can be uh, deep, can be, yes, sad, but not pathetic. Interesting. Do you... What does he mean by pathetic? What is, like what pathos. Is that in this, but like he, pathos. Like depressing. Like yeah. just, Very depressing. Because, yeah. you know, a Wallowing. lot of jazz yeah. is based on the blues, right? Mm -hmm. Which is sad music, but the purpose of it is to be happy. That's the point. That's the point that's of why, the blues. That's why I love the blues. I love uh, Sodaj uh, from Brazil. This, yeah. th that's, that's the same thing. I don't want to play background music. I don't mind playing while people talk and party, but we want the music to be uh, just real music. It sounds like in different ways you both want to make like a, a positive, transformative impact on your audience. Yeah. And music just, you know, when music is right, the feeling is so joyful, no matter what you're playing in a funny way, when it's really right. Right? Yeah, that's... That's a way of life. <laughs> if you are depressed, you can play depressed music, but it's no, I don't want to. Yeah. I mean, it's not like your pieces are saccharine and <laughs> no. like it's all happy and sugar. It's no, it's. it's you it's play like you are, deep. I think. Mm -hmm. you, you, can't, you can't really lie about yourself. Mm -hmm. You can, mm -hmm. but. That's no, that no, what we. We'll, we'll, we are looking for. I mean, no. Mm -hmm. I can, to be honest. Miles Davis said a great thing about that. He, as he said about many things, he said, sometimes it takes a long time for a person to learn to play like themselves. Yes. <laughs> right? You got to yeah. learn it. But, yes, but you can't help uh, yourself to be yourself. Yes. Yeah, you can't help it, right? The, yeah, but... I, uh, I understand. You can copy other musicians. Everyone's copy. Yeah. We have to copy and learn. Yeah, and that, yeah. But you absorb it and make it into your own. It's like you're a little f transformative factory for that. That's what uh, painters do mm -hmm. during years and years. That's what we do. Yeah. yeah. That's too. You know, we have to... Imitation in jazz is the kiss of death, but you have to do it to <laughs> learn. I, I wanted to make sure that we ask you, John... Um, do you remember when you first arrived in Business Song? What were your first impressions? What oh, was it I'd like? love to tell you about that. And what, what can <laughs> you know the Charlottesville residents expect if they go well, to visit first our of sister all, city? It's a beautiful city, and you need to know one thing in France if you know nothing else that your first word out of your mouth to anybody is bonjour. You say that, and you're, you're in. The next question is, do you speak English? And the answer is usually no. no. <laughs> so my funny thing about Besançon is, yeah, it's a beautiful city. And all the time that I didn't get to spend with our mayor, a lot of it I spent on the banks of that beautiful water, body of water, huge park. I practiced for hours out there. And that was just a delight. I just had the greatest time. But I usually go to Europe or have only gone to Europe as a professional musician with a road manager <laughs> who speaks the language, <laughs> and this was not that. And they set your agenda. And yeah, they, yeah, so there was none of that, and I was terrified, and I'm terrified of French, the language, hmm. because I just have this feeling that I don't have the ear for it. You know, it's, a, it's, it's jazz disease. It's a musician's, the bane of any musician's existence is we think we basically are terrible. <laughs> I mean, we fight with that. We, we work with that. We help the students with that. It's, that's the whole thing all the time. So there I am with no road manager. I mean, I got lost so many times trying to remember my way back to the hotel or whatever it was. But it was a beautiful experience to be there. And we were there in an arts festival. So there was a concert hall nearby where we were. We were hearing all kinds of music. And there was a, late, a woman on the tour uh, who was, I will say, even older than I. <laughs> And Sharon, and she and I just bonded, and we went everywhere. We broke into these rehearsals. We were like watching the orchestra when we shouldn't have been. It was really, we had a good time. Mm -hmm. So basis on, I mean, if you go there as a, as a visitor from the sister city, it's just the most welcoming, green, very green, very beautiful, beautiful space. 
I had, and it's small. I had a, can I say an amazing experience I had in business home, which was one day we were in a plaza somewhere getting food, you know, and everything. And this girl, and it was a girl, you know, probably about eight or nine years old, was up on a balcony playing her violin. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And so I got my trumpet and I started playing with her. And we played back and forth. People in the closet clapped. You know, it was just the mood of the thing. Later that day, or later, maybe another day, I can't remember, this little girl's walking along down the street with her dad. And she sees me and she start, starts jumping up and down telling her dad, <laughs> that's the guy. That's the guy. <laughs> and we talked. And the father turned out to be, um, his business was he booked jazz acts no he way. was an agent yeah. for jazz no music yeah. who's this guy i don't know <laughs> i should have found, i probably have his card somewhere i'm very bad at that so that was that but, maybe but, he'll be listening to our broadcast the girl was incredible maybe, he'll, this, he'll hear this audio i mean i have something that i always want to share mm -hmm. about music on the global way because it's jazz music from america okay mm -hmm. And it's just basically a kind of an algebra formula of something. There is a thing alive in the world that I like to call black music in the Americas that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the colonial project. And as we know, this music in America, for certain historical reasons, resulted in blues, gospel music, jazz music. This is black music. This was recorded. It went around the world. It changed the way people heard music everywhere in the world. Now we have people in every corner of the globe contributing at a very high level to this basically black American music, jazz music. And Dizzy Gillespie said a beautiful thing about it. He said, you can't steal a gift. So it is one of the greatest gifts that was ever given out of incredible suffering and travail and, you know, cataclysmic experience. So we acknowledge that gift. That's what, that's what, that's what I'm about. I wanted to go to Business Home and talk about that. It was not, uh, there was no road manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, but you're shame. continuing the conversation now. We are. That's well, well said. Thank you. Sage, you know, after the conversation, how do you feel about going to visit Besançon now? I'm really excited. We actually didn't keep this in the final cut, but when we asked <laughs> when we asked Damian what his favorite thing about Bezan Son was, he was just like, my mom. So, <laughs> um, but it, it sounds like a beautiful city. It sounds... Uh, it, it's actually funny. I live in Scottsville in here in Albemarle County, and Scottsville is like bisected by the James River in this big U shape. And Besançon has the exact same kind of geographical element of the river going through it uh, in a very similar shape. So I'm, I'm interested, you know, I know it's Charlottesville sister city, but right where I live is a very similar geographic place. Yeah. to uh, Besançon, so I'm very excited. Okay, cool. <laughs> How about you, Ben? What is your What was your takeaway from our conversation? Well, I was just interested to hear how, you know, Damien's career as a performer is so connected to all these different parts of France and the world from a kind of home base in Besançon. Um, and hopefully we can kind of participate in that sort of global connection happening on a local civic scale. Absolutely. You can find out more information about Damien and his music on his website, www.damiengrolo.fr. That's D-A-M-I-E-N-G-R-O-L-E-A-U dot F-R. More information about John and the UVA Jazz Ensemble can be found on the music department's website, music.virginia.edu. We'd like to extend a special thanks to David McNair for providing the recording we heard at the very end of the performance at the Paramount Theater. 
You can find video of the full concert performed at Old Cabell Hall on the UVA Music YouTube channel under the Live tab. Symposia is a production of the Brown College Community Media Initiative and the Virginia Audio Collective. This episode was produced by Sage Tangway and Ben Bernard, myself with production assistance from Sophia Moore. You can subscribe to Symposia and our sister show, Circle of Willis, wherever you get your podcasts.